In this video, I'll cover how to control when you want the glue constraints to break. By controlling the glue constraints and when they break, it will give you more control in the con destruction scene and allow you to produce more artistic visual effects. This video is a direct continuation from a previous video titled Control Destruction with Force Fields in Houdini. Link in the description. Now, we can add a stop solver. And actually program how the glue constraint breaks. Connect this SOP solver to the third input of the constraint network. This is the constraints solver. So this way we can control how we want the glue constraint to break. Now let's rewind this. Let's go back to the geometry vault for one second first. Now we have a glue uh, force field strength of 10,000. Okay, just remember that. I just wanted to see that. Now in the SOP solver, <clears throat> let's go inside. There are four nodes. Each node will give us different attributes in the geometry spreadsheet, but you need to be careful. Now, right now, nothing is showing in the geometry spreadsheet. You need to actually come back up to the thumbnail, run a few, few frames, and then go back into the SOP solver, and we should see something. Okay, for the impact, we're starting to see something. Data starting to flow through. Feedback. I don't see any feedback. Let's go here. Uh, let's go back up. Let's reset. We need to run a few frames. Now, it is quite annoying. Let's go back up here. Okay, now this populates the relationship geometry with some of the data that we need. Now, we need the primitive data because that's where the glue constraints are defined. There's also an impact attribute added here that we can use this. So the impact is the impact of the force acted upon each, uh, acted upon each fractured piece. Now, this is different from the force field force that we added. That's different from this force. Why? Because we have a gravity. So by the time it comes down to the glue constraints, there are two things already um, affected, two different forces already acting upon each fractured piece. So let's go back to the sub solver. We're gonna do, uh, we're gonna add an attribute wrangle. And we're gonna say, we're gonna do something super simple. Uh, remember to run over primitives. We're gonna say if, now the, impact the impact is a float so we're going to put f at impact if this is greater than i don't know um let's say ten thousand because uh ten thousand is the force is our force field acting upon it so if it's greater than ten thousand that's our force field actually i'm gonna have greater than or equal to ten thousand so anything that's affected by the force field let's just break the glue constraint. So we're going to go oh, S at constraint underscore name. S stands for string. So the constraint name is a string. We're just going to break it. And um, I'm going to do this by just blanking out the constraint name. This should break it automatically because the glue is then removed. You can also put it into this uh, group attribute, but um, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to blank it out. Let's go back up and give it a try. Oh, so it's starting to break. We're getting, we're getting somewhere. It's still not being anchored. Okay, so it's starting to break. That's, that's really nice. Now I'm going to increase this a little bit more by 10. Let's see what happens. Okay, it's still, no. The reason why it's still flying off is because the force is acting on the entire wall equally. So we want to add some randomizing to it. And we also want each fractured piece to have a different force value acting upon it. Ones that have more, one have less, to have a more interesting destruction effect. Now I'm going to take, we're going to do this. I'm going to take all the points of the fractured pieces 
and find the distance between the nearest point of the force. That's this. That's acting upon each fractured piece. So the force that is being applied to it, that position in the force field subtracted by the current position of the fractured piece. And I want the distance between that. And if that distance value is too far, that means that force field is not even close. It's not even close to that fractured piece. If it's too far, I want, I don't want to add additional force. So this way we can focus our force field in one, uh, in a particular area. So let's take this position. I want to subtract it. And I want to subtract it with the position of this force field. Well, we have the point value, the, the position, the force field is actually the point number is given by this, by this nearby point. So we already have the point number. However, we want to import another attribute and that's the P attribute. Let me drop down another import at point attribute. And that's this P value. So I'm going to rename this force field and I'm going to plug in the point number and I'm going to plug in the same file input here. Now I'm going to, the result is the position of the force. Oh, sorry. Position here. So this, this gives us the distance value. Now I want to put an absolute uh, value because I, I don't care about the direction. I want just the distance. So I'm going to put it null. This is our distance. Now not only I want it, I want the distance, I also want to export this distance value and attach it to the geometry spreadsheet. Now I'm going to be use I'm going to be using this distance value to shade this a simulation to shade the wall to e shade each fractured piece and put a color so we need a bind export now we bind export will export this distance value that's what we want so let's hook this up here and we're going to call this distance so that's what i want right now so before we hook this all up now right now we're just calculating distance we're not this is not affecting the force at all now i'm going to do that a little later first i want to set up the material for it so you can have it so you can visually see what I mean now in order for us to set up a material for this fractured wall we need to export we need a dop import in this wall so let's drop out a dop import mode we want to import the geometry from the simulation into this context so this dop import this dop net now let's pick the dop net that's in the simulation. That's this dot net right here. Now, what's the object mask? Well, let, let's go to the simulation. Now, that's this RBD packed object. That's what we want to import. That's the wall. Let's go back to the top import. Now, object mask will RBD. Asterisk will match anything that matches the RBD. Now, import style. Let's transport fetch geometry from DOP network. Once we click that, the geometry comes right out. But if you look carefully, this is our packed geometry. So this has 610 points. So we go over here to the assembly node, click this I. It has 611, sorry, 611 because it's zero based. So um, right here. If I scroll this all the way up, it's zero based. So it's actually 611 points. So that, that's equal. However, if we go to the Warner fracture here and I go to the I and look at this, this has 11,496 points. So it has significantly more points. This assemble node has a lot less points because we packed it. It's packed geometry. So let's come back down here to the DOP import. Now, when we fetch it, we're fetching it as is. We're not fetching it and unpacking it. If I choose this, it will unpack it for us and we'll have 11,496 points because it's zero based over here. So we'll have the same number that we had in the Warner Fracture. However, if you look carefully, I don't have my distance. Distance, the distance attribute I created here, it's nowhere to be found. And if we go back to the dot net, if I click the simulation, 
the RBD pack geometry. Let's uh, geometry here. So let's come down here and let's see. Let's look for our distance value. Uh, oh, I might need to sim. I, I might need to run the simulation for a few frames for it to calculate. Okay, so we have we're in frame eight. There you go. There's our distance value right here. In fact, I can isolate it. Here we go. There's our distance vector. <clears throat> oh, actually, it's a vector. I might have made a mistake. Sorry. Let me go back in here. Let's go to dot net. Go back to the geometry vault. Let's close this up a bit. So this, it should be exporting it as a float. Subtract absolute. Oh. I missed something. I apologize. I want the length. The length of this vector. Because when I subtract, when I do the subtraction right here, it gives, when you're subtracting the P vector, the positional vector of the force field, and the positional vector of the current fractured piece, vector minus vector will give you another vector. But I don't really care about the direction of the vector. I want the magnitude of the vector. Therefore, I apply a length. That's what I was missing here. And actually, I don't need the absolute value anymore. But it, it's not hurting it right now. So, this absolute value is not necessary. I'm just going to take it out, actually. So now we're writing the distance. And let's sim a few frames in order to get this to update. Okay, now we have the correct distance. We have a float for the distance. This is what we're gonna use. This is what we need. So let's go back up all the way to the wall. Now let's go back here. This stop import. Now we're not importing the distance. The distance is it's gone, it's missing. That's because we're unpacking it here. Don't unpack it here. We're going to have to do it an extra step. So just fetch the geometry as is. Fetch geometry from DOP network without unpacking it. And we're going to have to do this as an extra step. So unpack it here. Let's put the... And it's going to ask us what attributes you want to transfer after you unpack it. So just choose the distance there. And here's our distance. Let's rewind a few frames so we actually see the wall. So remember to remove this material so you don't get confused. Now it doesn't really matter right now because I don't have any materials set up for this scene at all. But if you do have materials, remember to uncheck this. Otherwise, you're gonna the materials will start to overwrite the color and you won't know which one's which. At least turn it off for the debugging uh, as you're still developing the scene. So now I'm going to add attribute VOP. Let's go in here. Now let's get the distance. Now how do I access the distance? You use a bind. Bind. Not bind export, but bind. This will import the distance value. Just, oh, sorry. So just type distance here. Now, this will bring us the distance. The distance at the moment, it's a value, it, it, it's really, it, it's a positive value. So we need to remap this. So put down a fit range. And I'm going to remap this. Now this distance value goes to an insane number. So the maximum, let's say, uh, Let's, let's say, let's go to 100,000. Now, this goes way over 100,000, but we, we want the ones that are on the higher end to be really deep color. And if you remember correctly, color is between a value between 0 and 1. So we're going to choose, hook this remapped value into a ramp, and a ramp parameter. We want a ramp parameter. So click this, and then take the output of the ramp and plug it into the CD. So we're going to overwrite the color and immediately you see everything black. So this is a good time to um, fix this ramp. 
Let's turn this back up over here. So let's take this, let's go up to 400. 100, let's make this smaller then. Okay, there we go, 100. Let's go to the ramp. Now the ramp always appears on the top level. So if I pull this down, here we go, this is the ramp. This is the actual color of the ramp. So if you modify anything in here, nothing will happen. So let's modify this. Let's give it a, a red and this green. Now it's very hard to see. So let's go down here. Fit range. Let's go and put it 50. Okay. Now it turns because it gets further and further away. That's why. Let's try 10. I think that's pretty good because the distance value uh, calculates on this uh, up after the first frame. We had hooked up in the simulation here we here let me go in first this geometry vop is hooked up to this plug post solve so that happens after uh the rigid body solver is calculated and the rigid body solver does its calculation so you have to at least run one frame for to populate the distance so let's go back here so now we have we have an idea we visual we can visually see how the force field or where the force field is between the force points and the fracture wall we can visually see it through this color we want to use this distance value to help us focus our force field to a certain area on the fractured wall we want to concentrate the force field in the center which is the red colored pieces you see in the 3d viewport right now so in the geometry vop here, in this geometry vop, we have the distance. If the distance is too far, don't do anything. Don't do anything to the force. That's what we want. Move this over so I have more real estate. So we need an if statement. This distance. Now, okay, let's drop down and compare. Now, if this distance value less than, if it's less than, let's say, a Let's do 50. So if the distance between the force point and the fractured piece is less than 50, then this is true. We need an if statement and we need if block. I'm gonna put a constant through this block. This constant is gonna be a vector. It will be zero force is what we want. So if it's too far away from the force field, we want that fractured piece to have zero force. We don't want it to move. We want it to move as little as possible. So we're gonna put zero force in it. But you need to remember, the zero force doesn't mean it doesn't move completely because we still have gravity that's being affected after it runs through this geometry vault. We can only control it to some degree within this context. So I'm gonna put a force here and the end output, if you add an input here and then put a force here, there's going to be an implicit line that runs from here to here. What this means, if this condition is met, that means it's less than 50. It's true. It will run everything within this blue area, this blue block. It will run the code in here. So if I put this add and I stick it over here. Oops, sorry, not here. Uh, to the. If I stick it in here, if I stick this over here, so we're gonna replace this okay so when this condition meets that means it's less than 50 this force point will be the one that is getting returned outputted from this block end. this is what will be however if this is false this zero force point will run through this if block and this implicit line now it's hard to see now i don't know if you can see this implicit this really light light purplish line right here will be the one that gets outputted when this condition is false so that's what this means so that's how we uh this is alternating between these two values this zero and this additional force these two values is what gets returned from this if block if it's false zero force if it's true the additional force gets returned so let's give this a try oh i don't have to come up 
Okay, that's not much difference. Let's make this a lot smaller. Let's give it 10. So we have more force acting, but the whole, our main, or still our main issue is that the whole wall gets blown over. But now that we focus the force to a certain area, so the ones, the ones in the middle here, they're breaking up more. They're breaking up more quickly. We can use this to target this impact. Oh, impact, sorry, the impact. So the, there, we have ones that have zero impact. Now let's go all the way back up. I want to visualize this. Let's turn off the the marker. But as you can see, the the force field is pushing the whole wall away, and is getting the the wall is getting too far before it even starts fracturing. So there isn't enough time for the force to act on it. Let's go back into the dot now. Now that we have our force field focused in the middle of the wall, in order to complete my visual effect, I want a destruction to break the wall in the middle and have the destruction grow from there, destroying it, destroying the wall completely. I want a ball-shaped destruction to appear in the middle where the force field is. So we need to play around with this force strength in our geometry vault and in the SOP solver, there's this um, threshold that we use to break the constraints. We need to play around with these two numbers and get a sweet spot. Uh, keep adjusting it until you get the effect that you, you like. Now, I did this ahead of time. So this, I came down to the conclusion, I think it was a thousand for the glue strength, uh, sorry, force field strength and the SOP solver. I used... 500, I believe it was. Let me give this a try. Nope, uh, I need this geometry vault to be a little bit more. Let's give it 10,000. Too much. Uh, the distance. Now, instead of distance, I want it to be a lot closer. So I want the area of the force field to be more focused. So I'm going to go 1. Okay, it's starting to look a little bit better. The glue is still kind of strong. Some of it's breaking up. But it's still not the effect that I want. Let's go back up. Let's go to the salt solver. Sorry, the salt solver here. Uh, 5,000. So I'm going to put this 500. I'm going to try this again. So it's starting to get that. I'm starting to see the destruction shaped shaped like the force field it's being shaped at like my force field so my force field it's starting to really affect the destruction now i'm starting to get the 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 sweet spot that i've been talking about between those two numbers you have to keep playing around with it until you get the effect that you you want i can actually take this even further and take and add more glue constraint relationships by going up here to the fractured wall, over here, uh, here. The constraint name, if I pull this down, sorry, I'm just going to pull this down. Now, this is glue. This is everything. This is every single constraint that we have here. Everything is a glue. We can randomly pick certain, uh, certain constraints and make them a little stronger. So we have something more random. We can do that. We, there's a lot of things we can uh, add variation to this simulation. In the force field, we can add more randomness to the force field. Because right now, every force is equal. And that's not very interesting. And also, the shape of this force field... Let me just put it right here. It's, it's constant. This shape is constant throughout the whole... In the, throughout the entire simulation it would be interesting to see what it would look like if if we start animating this sphere so we can make it a lot smaller so let me drag this up that would be the easiest way to do this let me add a transform node right here and we're going to animate this i'm going to disable the simulation because i just want to see the sphere right now so we're starting off here let's make it a lot smaller here now let's 
when I do this, it, it starts to scale and move the sphere. Now that's not what I want. Here, click this pivot transformation. We want the pivot to be the centroid. So click this. There's an expression called CX, oh, CX, then CEY. So what this does, it gets me the center X, center Y, and center Z. It gives me all three center. It will pivot the scale in the center. So once we start lowering this number, look, it, it doesn't move. It makes it smaller without moving it. So this is what we want to keep it here for. Let's animate it from here, and I don't know, maybe 25 frames here. We want this to be a lot bigger. Let's rewind this, and let's see what happens. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, sorry, I had turned off the simulation and I forgot. So, uh, turn this back on. And then run the simulation. <laughs> you can really see, let me turn off the markers. So it's starting to look a lot better. Let's replay a few frames. Okay, I'm going to turn off the force field. I don't want to see that. So this is starting to look a lot nicer. Let's go into the wall. Okay, down here. I'm going to add a file cache. So I'm going to call this uh, destruction sim, uh, destruction scene, I'll call it. I'm gonna take out my usual hip name. Now, this is totally optional. I'm only taking this out because I have multiple versions of this file. It's easier for recording, but you can leave that uh, dollar hip name. This, uh, you need to leave. You need to leave this in for dollar sign F because this will cache every single frame. And since our destruction scene is um, breaking on every single frame, that's what we're, we want to cache. So check this, load from disk, and just click save to disk. I'm not going to cache it yet. I'm going to throw down a null first and put render. Remember to put the render flag here, and this is ready to cache. Uh, this is ready for render after you cache it. All right, it just finished caching, so I'm just going to play this. So that's how it looks like. I'm going to go up here and turn on the force field so we can uh, see what the force field looks like. Oh, it's a lot slower with the force field. So I'm going to cache the force field as well. I didn't think this would be so slow. But it is. Okay, let's, uh, sorry. let's put a file cache here. Right before uh, the null out. We're going to call this force field. Again, I'm going to take out the dollar hip, uh, dollar hip name. You can leave that in. It's only because I have multiple files, uh, multiple versions of this hip file. But remember to leave the dollar sign F. So that one's important. Okay, it just finished caching. So let me rewind this. It's a lot faster now. Now let's go back up and start playing it now. There you go. So you see the force field animation as the force field grows and grows and grows and grows. It completely uh, demolishes the wall once it hits its maximum size in our uh, force field animation. I can. Uh, I wonder if I can template this. Turn this. Okay. Let's let's view it with the templated sphere. Okay, you can't really tell the, the sphere. Over the last month, it's been super busy, and I haven't been able to keep up with regular uploads because I've been burning out. The overlays on each video take so long to process during video editing, so I'm trying to automate some of the simpler tasks, and hopefully, given time, I'll be able to produce more videos in the future. Thank you for watching and sticking to the end.